sorry. Uh, turn with, with me in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 13. And where have my message notes gone? Ezekiel chapter 13. <clears throat> and we'll just start by reading the first couple of verses. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit, and have seen nothing. Let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can once again gather here this morning and um, enjoy each other's fellowship, and we um, thank you that we can spend the time singing praises to you, Lord, and now as we come to the message, we thank you that we can have this opportunity. Lord, I ask that you would just prepare our hearts and our minds for the message, and that you would help us to put aside distractions and allow us to uh, concentrate and understand what is said and apply it to our lives. Lord, I ask that you would just give me the wisdom and understanding I need and that you would give me the right words to say and that only your truth would be heard here. Lord, I ask that you would um, forgive me if I say anything that's wrong and I ask that those things would be forgotten so that only your perfect truth would remain in our hearts and in our minds. And in Jesus' name, Amen. <coughs> Before the French Revolution there were quite a number of issues with their country. One of the major issues was that they were running out of money. And the Minister of Finance, Jacques Necker, was in one of the primary reasons for this. See, Jacques Necker was in charge of ensuring that France maintained its, mo its good money credit. He had to mon monitor how much the, the crown was spending. He had to raise or lower taxes. And he had to ensure that France remained in the, in the black. But Jacques, he didn't want to upset the balance of things. He didn't want to upset people. He didn't want to raise taxes. He didn't want to cause any issues. He didn't want to rock the boat. He didn't want to recognise his own failures. So every time someone would ask him, how's the accounts, he would say, everything is fine. He would say that, oh, we can do things, we have the money. In fact, what Jacques did, even, what did was he even published a book. Now, I'm going to probably slaughter this, but he published a book called The Comte Rendu à Roy, which was basically just the account book of the king. And in it, he made it out to, made it out to look as if the account, or the, the king's account, was 10 million in profit. But in truth, they were about 47 million in deficit. But the book was popular. People loved it. In fact, there, was, there are records that said that people learned to read reading that book. Now, Jacques didn't remain in office. And a man who replaced him was named Colune. And when he got the, the accounts, he realised the issue. He realised there was a problem. He thought he could fix it. And his, suggest, or his solution was what they called youthful splendour. You see, he continued to take out loans, but at better rates, hoping that he could pay off the more expensive loans and fix the problem enough that eventually the taxes could resolve the, the rest. This didn't work. And eventually he, had to, he ran out of time and he had to enforce a radical reform. But the problem was nobody realised there was a problem. For years and years they had always, always been told there was no issue. 
So now when these radical reforms were suggested, people were scratching their heads going, why? What's, what's the issue? Eventually, he was fired from his office because they didn't believe him. They brought back Jacques and Jacques said, oh, there's no issue. It was just an accounting error. And even right up to the French Revolution, when the monarchy was bankrupt and there was no money to pay to, to buy food for the people, people still believed there was no issue. Now, I know that was a bit long-winded long for an introduction. But it's important to recognise that people will swallow a lie when it tastes sweet. When they don't want to see the issues. When they don't want to recognise their wickedness. In Ezekiel chapter 13, God is addressing those who spread false li falsities and lies. People that were meant to protect the people against sin and wickedness, who were meant to correct the people when they strayed. Ezekiel chapter 13 is directed at the prophets and the prophetesses of Israel. In verses 2 and 3, we find the major issue with them. Their greatest crime. In verse 2, the Son of Man prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. These men said that they had heard the word of the Lord, that they had understood it clearer than anyone else. But in truth, they were preaching out of their own hearts and out of their own spirit. But in truth, they had seen nothing. They had heard nothing. They had not understood what God's word said. These men didn't want to rock the boat. They didn't want to upset people. And so they thought they, they could change what God's word said to make people feel more comfortable. They didn't want to warn them of where their wickedness and sinfulness would lead to. They did not recognise that the, the truth comes from the Holy Ghost and not themselves. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 and verses 20 to 21. This is in the New Testament looking back and is making a commentary on how the Old Testament prophets spoke the truth and applying it to the New Testament. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. They were moved by the Holy Ghost. That was the foundation of truth. It wasn't their own hearts. It wasn't their own spirit. It was the Holy Ghost that moved them to speak. It was the Holy Ghost that gave them the truth. And that truth had but one meaning, one interpretation. God's. Its message was always to be clear. But these prophets spoke out of their own hearts and they followed after their own spirit and they were, they were described as being foolish. They are foolish. And in verse five, oh, in verse four, sorry, they are described as foxes. O Israel, the prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Now, a fox is known for its cunning and craftiness. And being in the desert where there is little food, they are desperate for prey. They are ravenous. These prophets are ravenous for prey, ravenous for victims to listen to them. And they are crafty and cunning when they are trying to seduce people into their way of thinking. And they had a great way of doing it. 
Firstly, they would abandon the, the, the proper defences and let sinfulness into the country. In verse 5, Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They had not gone up into the gaps. This speaks of a breach in a city wall. And in times of war, when the city wall was breached, soldiers would be sent to that gap. They would stand in there and replace the destroyed wall with their own lives to hold the line and prevent destruction. They would have put them themselves in the firing line to save everyone. If this was what their task was as the prophets of Israel, they would have stand in the gap, hold back the sin and wickedness of the world. They would preserve the purity of Israel. And failing that, if they couldn't stop sin and wickedness from entering into the country widespread, then they were to establish sanctuaries for the faithful and for the righteous. They weren't to give in to sin and join the wickedness. Neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They were to create fallback points. Places where righteous men and women could gather when God's judgment fell. They did not repair the breaches. They did not make up these sanctuaries. And the story of Rahab in Jericho. The walls fell except for, for Rahab's house. She remained faithful. She trusted in the promise of the spies and her and her household were saved when God's judgment fell upon the city. But here, the prophets had failed to do even that. So God judges them. They have seen vanity and lying divination saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have ye not seen a vain vision? And have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas ye say, The Lord hath saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord God. These prophets who had usurped God's authority and position, who said that God said this and God said that, who told lies to the people and told them that they were okay to sin and give in to wickedness. These men God sends from his presence. He takes their authority and their positions away. They will not be in the assembly of my people. He re revokes their citizenship. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. In essence, what God is saying is these are not my people. They are not my people because my people know me. My people know when I speak, they hear my voice. And when I call my people home after this judgment, when their time of exile is over, these people shall not be returned with the rest. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Here they are given a serious punishment. Their citizenship is revoked. The promises offered to Israel are null and void to these men. This is the seriousness of their crime. For those that would stand up, or sh whose job it is to stand up and speak the truth, they ought to do that. They shouldn't shrink in the, in the face of danger or hostility. They shouldn't back down when the enemy attacks. 
They shouldn't compromise when told it would be easier if you just change the message a little. We are given a serious task to preach the gospel, to defend the church against false teaching. to be on the lookout for wolves in sheep's clothing. And sometimes, and this can primarily apply to those who stand in the pulpit. But the warning must be given to all because all need to be on watch. Churches have fallen because the congregation was found asleep and allowed the wolves into the pulpit. Lives have been lost because those who were given the task of preaching the gospel watered it down. They didn't want to offend people. They didn't want to hurt people's feelings. So they made that things which were sin, not sin. They said people can go on living how they want to live. They have a license to sin so long as they accepted Christ as their saviour. God has told us that we need to stand and speak the truth. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, and starting in verse 13. Here Christ tells us to be on the lookout for wolves in sheep's clothing. And note how he describes it, starting in verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in there, thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Here Christ describes that there are two paths, no more, no less, the path of life and the path of death. And one of the reasons he gives for why more people choose the path of death is in the following verse. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The reason why the path of death is so much greater is not just simply because it is an easier path to go to, but because those who are given the task of preaching the truth, declaring the gospel, that there is such a place as hell, that God will judge. There are those that say the opposite. Those that weaken the gospel, water it down and tell people that there's no danger. Beware of false prophets. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. We are to be on the lookout. Now certainly we are, we are told not to judge each other in a way that we are going around checking. But we are to be cautious. We are to make sure that those who we give the privilege and honour of preaching the gospel in the pulpit behind the pulpit are living a life that is acceptable to that of honour and glory. And those that corrupt the pulpit, those who water down the message, those that say there is peace when there is no peace. The truth is they are most likely not even saved. Now some may be and may have fallen, but the majority most likely have never accepted Christ as their saviour. And the sad day will come when they will stand before God. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew ye. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. 
Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You never had citizenship with me. I never knew you. You will not be allowed to enter into the land. Sound familiar? God goes on to describe another way how the prophets had failed the people. You see, not only had they failed by not standing in the gap, not only had they failed by not establishing sanctuaries for the, for the righteous when evil came into the land, but they had failed by creating a false hope. Starting in verse 10, because even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace. And one built up a wall, and though others dub, daubed it with untempered mortar. Say unto them which dubbed it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, Where is the dobbing wherewith ye have dobbed it? Therefore thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger, and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. So will I break down the wall that ye have daubed with untempered mortar, and bring it down to the ground, so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered, and it shall fall, and ye shall be consumed in the midst thereof, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall, and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar, and will say unto you, The wall is no more, neither they that daubed, daubed it. To wit, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord God. See, these prophets, they did not just simply forsake the truth, they established a false, false hope. They built their own wall. The wall didn't look great. The wall was flimsy, it was thin. There is a difference in the, in the Hebrew words between the wall that with the gap and the wall that they built. It is a thin wall. It is more of a partition than any real wall that would hold a defensible position. But to make it look better, they dubbed it with mortar. They whitewashed it. They made it look pretty. They made it look fancy. And they went around to others and said, this is where salvation lies. You'll be safe if you hide behind this wall. But when God's judgment came, that wall did not stand. There is no salvation in any other name except Jesus Christ. There was no salvation for the people of Israel except in God's truth. They taught the people that God didn't care, but they cared. They taught the people that their wall was better than God's wall. They seduced the people. But in the end, when judgment came and their foundations of the wall were revealed, the people would see the deceitfulness of the prophets. They would see that they were liars. But of course, by that time, it was too late. Those who hid behind the wall saw too late their mistake. God does not like when his word is, to corrupt, is corrupted and watered down. He established his word to endure forever. It is the light that guides or should, that should guide our life. The Bible is how God has, has established a way to talk to us. And we need to be careful when we read it, that we don't apply our own understanding to it, that we don't try to look into it with our own spirit. When we share it with others, we need it to make sure that it is not our own spirit that is speaking to them, but rather the Holy Ghost. We need to make sure that our hearts are centred on God and not ourselves.
Yes, the truth is offensive. Yes, when we tell people that their way of life is wrong, they may be offended and upset. But the fear is that when we water down the gospel, when we, make, when we try to save people in that way, we fall into the same trap as the Pharisees. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. Here Christ is talking to the Pharisees. <clears throat> chapter, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 15. Woe well unto the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. You see, these people give false righteousness. They say that how you're living your life is fine. You can live however you like. They blind them to the truth so that when someone does come with the truth, they don't recognise it. They don't see their need to actually accept Christ as their saviour. They think they can save themselves by their own works or they think that they're already saved. But there are only two paths, Christ or hell. And there are many in the world today that think they are saved. Many in the world today that think they can live however they like because in the end, God will forgive them. Many who think that they are saved by their own works or saved by some other priest who simply says, I forgive you. But forgiveness is not in the hands of man, but in the hands of God. And it is at his throne that we need to plead for that forgiveness. It is at his throne that we need to bow and submit to his will. When he says, thou shalt not, we need to make sure we don't. When he says, thou shalt, we need to make sure we do. We need to live a life that is pleasing to God and we need to tell others of the danger of re rejecting him. <clears throat> And Ezekiel is told to go on. So the issue isn't just simply the men who were prophesying, but also the prophetesses. <clears throat> In verse 17, Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart, and prophesy thou against them. So the daughters of the people... They were also guilty of the same crime. They spoke from their own heart, not the Holy Ghost, not out of the Lord's leading, but rather because of how they felt. And say, thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the woman that sow pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will ye hunt the souls of my people? And will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? Here the women are described as being hunters, searching for prey, laying traps, seducing people into a false hope. They made themselves comfortable. They lived in luxury and encouraged others to come and see them. But what they were really doing was setting a trap and baiting it with nice things. They hunt for people, not to save them, but to condemn them and doom them. And will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies? Not only did they set traps for people to seduce them away from how God would have them for people to live, but they accepted bribes to change the word of God, to, con to condemn the righteous, to uplift the wicked. Those that preached against the wickedness of, the, of Israel 
these women would say that they're in the wrong, that God doesn't really mean that. Instead, what they need to do is go look behind that other wall, the wall set up by these other prophets. That's where salvation is. Go hide behind that. That's where you will find life. These, people turn, or these women turned the people against God's righteous people. God's righteous prophets who try to stand up and preach the truth. And so God will not spare these prophetesses either. Wherefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly. And I will tear them from your arms, and will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt to make them fly. Your kerchiefs also will I tear, and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand, to be hunted, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. The Lord is concerned with his people. The Lord is concerned when they are seduced. He is concerned when false prophets rise up to lead his people away. And he will punish those who are false prophets, those who are wolves in sheep's clothing. And he will do what he must to save his people because he does care. These women will lose all that they had. All their tricks would be broken down. Their traps would be destroyed. His people would be set free. But these women also had another effect on the righteous. They didn't just simply turn the, right, the, the people against them, but they also disheartened the righteous as well. Because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthen the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. These women had disheartened the righteous man. The prophets who did stand up and remained faithful, who was seen as the enemy, they were attacked. They were forsaken. And they were beginning to lose hope. This is the inf impact of false prophets. They steal away those that may be saved. And those who continue to preach the truth become disheartened as more and more become out of, or move out of reach thinking that they are already saved and need no, nothing else, thinking that they have already heard the truth. We need not, or we shouldn't lose heart. We know that God is in control. But God has made us creatures of feeling, of care and compassion. He tells us to have concern for the world around us, and sometimes when we look out into the world and see all the harsh things, when we see all the wickedness, when we see how people treat each other, and we see people thinking that they are saved from destruction, when in fact they are still doomed to hell, that can be disheartening. It can be hard to bear sometimes. And we can bear that to God. We can leave that in his arms because we know that he does care for people. We know that he can tear those souls from, the, from those who would seduce them and put them back into a place where they can hear the truth. We need to keep preaching the truth when that day comes. The hands of the wicked, oh, that they have strengthened the hands of the wicked that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. They think they're safe. They think they're strong, but they will fall. Therefore ye shall see no more vanity, nor divine divinations. For I will deliver my people out of your hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Not only will they lose their luxury, their possessions, not only will he tear down their traps and free his people, 
He will cut off their ability to see and lie. They will not have the opportunity to seduce anyone else. He will deliver his people from their hand. God does care. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he is truly saddened when there are false prophets telling people that they can be saved through another way, another path. We need to stand up against these people. We don't need to join them. We don't need to compromise. But we need to preach the truth. Because only the truth can set us free. Only the truth can guide us to the straight and narrow path to to salvation. There are many places throughout the Bible that describe how Christians will become in the latter days. How we will begin to live like the world. Those days are here. It doesn't take much effort to go onto the internet and find those who preach what they call truth and yet say that people can live however they like or that there is salvation by some other path. These people encourage wickedness. They build up those who persuade and seduce others to sin. And when somebody stands up to them, they are quick to be aggressive. They are quick to attack them and tear them down. They they are quick to try and turn the, the people against them. But we need to stand in the gap. We need to build the hedges. We need to remain faithful to God and leave everything else in his hand. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you do help us and strengthen us even when we are in the midst of a wicked nation and a wicked world. Lord, we ask that you would just give us the wisdom and understanding to um, see the false prophets, to recognise the wolves in sheep's clothing, to protect the church and the faithful from them. Lord, we ask that you would just give us the courage and the wisdom to stand up to these people who preach a false truth. Give us the wisdom to debate them and reveal the truth to others. Lord, we ask that you would just keep us safe and that you would just help us to continue to stand on your truth and to encourage each other and to lift up each other and help us to stand united in the gap. In Jesus' name, amen.